Heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord, but you don't really care for music, do ya? Well, it goes like this: the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major left, the baffled king composing. Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof, her beauty, and the moonlight overthrew ya. Well, she tied you to her kitchen chair. She broke your throne and cut your hair. Good morning and welcome. We have come together to remember and celebrate the life of Jody Ann Evans and her brother, Michael Ron Evans. Jody was born October 17, 1969, and Michael was born September 20th, 1973, and passed away together on August 26, 2016. Death in a number of ways unites us all and Jody's and Michael's death for a time demands that each one of us put aside our toil, our cares and pleasures to unite ourselves with everyone here. Mourners all who share in the common bond of love and friendship for them. With our last thoughts and respect for Jody and Michael, I think it is fitting that we should reflect on their time with us and the influence they had in our lives. Because of this, we would like to share with you through words, pictures, and song, just a brief sampling of who they were to us. First of all, I'd like to call for Larry McAllister. He's going to be doing the eulogy for Michael. Stairs around this side. Michael Ron Evans was a friend of mine and a neighbor. He had just moved back to the area, Beaver Lodge, from Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. While going to their grandpa's birthday, he and his sister Jody passed away as a result of a traffic accident on Friday, August 26th, 2016, near Stetler, Alberta. Michael was 43 years old. He was born September 1973, and after living four years in high level, he moved with his family to Chinook Valley. He grew up enjoying the freedom of country life. In 1982, the family again moved to the Grand Prairie area where Michael was able to play hockey, join Wembley Judo Club, and take guitar lessons. He graduated from Beaver Lodge High School in 1991 
and 2001 received a physical education degree from the University of Alberta. He worked for a few years in the phys ed field and more recently in the farming landscaping business, businesses. Michael loved hiking and backpacking trips, mountain biking with friends, and playing the guitar. As his high school motto said, he was simply one of the best. You will be sadly missed by his sisters, Jackie Evans and Dakota Michelle Evans. Brothers-in-law, Lloyd Ayers and Mike Amaral. And parents, Ron and Janet Evans. He was predeceased by his grandparents, Ivan and Gladys Hoover, and his other grandmother, Marjorie Evans, and his sister, Jody. I wasn't really predeceased, but. Do you know what memories I'm going to keep? Just for me. That smile, that all-encompassing smile that seemed to overwhelm you and take you out of your less-than-perfect world for a while. Thanks, Michael. P.S. That smile seems to run in the family. Soon after he moved to our neighborhood, he got a Suzuki dirt bike from George Harms, his neighbor, and set out to wear the roads and trails out. Eventually, Michael graduated to the cast-off family 1974 Chev pickup and wore the roads and trails out again. Standard boy growing up stuff, right? Both vehicles took him to Wembley, sometimes to the judo club for practice and eventually teaching. Judo got rid of energy and tension for Michael. Now for the really cool stuff. Michael was a guitar picker not just a strummer, a picker. Cool, how cool is that? He played quite a bit with his neighbor, Mark Sotart. This is something more abstract, kind of like that smile I talked of earlier. Definitely an asset though. The Evans have group glue, the want to belong to a group, in this case, our community. They joined the community and we joined them. It was effortless. This group glue rubbed off on Michael and it showed. This was his community. He kept coming back. I'm sticking with Michael's life is all good smile as his best asset. That's what I will keep in my memory. Thank you, Michael. Rest in peace. Thank you. I'll ask uh, Kathy Newhook if she can make her way to the front, and she will be doing the eulogy for Jody.
Hi. Well, we're all here today in bright colors to celebrate the lives of Jody, Ann, and Michael Ron Evans. Those close to Jody know she is beaming that one of a kind smile at us right now. It must run in the family. Uh, Jody loved a gathering of her people and the coming together as a community. Jody and Mike embraced all that life had to offer in different ways. Both inspired, gotta get this over my face. Both inspired the people around them to do the things they loved. I'm Kathy Newhook, a friend of Jody Evans, and I had the privilege of knowing her brother Michael. I am very honored to talk about Jody's remarkable life today. Jody Ann, she was born October 7th, 1969, in Fort Vermilion, Alberta. After Janet and Ron made a 50 mile drive on dirt roads and a ferry ride across the mighty Peace River. Despite all odds, she arrived on time. Janet remembers two-year-old Jackie asking, did you get her at the post office? So wherever that bundle of joy came into the world, we are all grateful. The four Evans children, Jackie, Jody, Michelle, and Michael, grew up in a loving environment, close to the land in high level, then on their farm in the Chinook Valley of Northern Alberta. Jody described their childhood as both rural and wondrous. They raised unusual animals, including highland cattle, ducks, pigs, and chickens, farm using archaic machinery, ate what their garden produced, had the freedom to run and dance, and attended live music. They learned to downhill ski as a family at the local Manning Ski Hill, tractor, tow rope, and all. Many of the Evans family memories and vacations were made up in the National Park. Jody talked of the family camping, canoeing, hiking trips, and she loved the Christmases in Jasper. It was no wonder Jasper in the Mountains held such a special place in her heart. Jody and Michael's combined love of adventure in the outdoors was a gift from their upbringing given to them by their parents. The Evans family moved to Grand Prairie area in 1982, and Jody graduated from Grand Prairie Composite in 1987. She had a lifelong passion for learning both in her formal education and in her natural quest for knowledge. Jody attended Red Deer College, then the U of A, where she met and married Armand Urian. She graduated in 1992 with a degree in recreation with baby Crosby in her arms. During that time, she found her calling to help others and discovered her passion for social justice. She would later obtain a Bachelor of Social Work in 2002 and a Master's in 2014 while raising her three children and working full time. Jody had a strong work ethic and boundless energy. Anyone who met her could feel the positive presence radiating from her. Motherhood. Her passion, love, and pride for her children, Crosby, Megan, and Caleb, was her life. Jody was a brilliant mom. She hiked, biked, and skied with babies on her back. She had family game nights and bonfires. She loved family dinners and sing-alongs. She took her children camping and danced at music festivals. She bravely drove solo across Canada with three teenagers in tow. As Megan remembers, that trip was before they had Google Maps. There was a few tense moments in Montreal 
with maps flying around the new Mazda. She should have got a Nobel Peace Prize for that. Jody always included her most beloved people in her activities. This summer, when Jody was talking about the upcoming family hiking trip on the Skyline Trail in Jasper, she said, not everyone will enjoy it while we're doing it, but it'll be worth the laughs and the memories afterwards. How right she was. Her son Caleb confirmed this when he said, I was pretty grumpy the first two days. I got soaked the first night in the tent while Megan and Crosby stayed dry. But by the end, it was fun. She was such a wise and intuitive mama. Her favorite memories were the days with her three children when they were all home with her at her house by the Beaver Lodge River. Jody's incredible legacy lives on through her loving family. Jody's work was very important to her, defined by helping others. Ten years with the Canadian Red Cross, where she helped develop disaster relief programs. Jody was one of the first volunteers to be deployed to the floods in High River. She worked at community social planning at the FCSS in Beaver Lodge, and then moved to the county of Grand Prairie as a school liaison worker. She had a positive impact on the students she counseled as well as her fellow co-workers. In 2014, she took on a new leadership role with the County of Grand Prairie, where she excelled. Her mind was so very bright. She was both thought-provoking and an amazing listener. I loved her voice. Jody could take in information and quietly formulate response that everyone wanted to listen to. She was a dear and beloved friend to so many of us. Jody was a minimalist, as long as she had red wine and dark chocolate. She was the glue that connected many different groups of people. She started a woman's hiking group in 2004 that morphed into a book slash wine club. In our February book club, it was Jody's pick. Jody gathered us all up to volunteer for the Rotary, Feed the Hungry. Then we met at the art gallery and saw a beautiful art show. And then we sat in the sun under the atrium discussing a fantastic book. That sums up Jody's essence. The importance of a supportive social network of strong women was part of Jody's fabric. Through the good times and the bad times, she laughed, cried, hiked and danced with all of us. She was able to ask for help when she needed it, and she was the first to give anyone one of her famous Jody hugs. I don't know about you, but when Jody hugged, she would always give a little extra squeeze, a little pat in the back. It was so great. Jody was self-reflective. This was not by chance. With intention, she made notes and goals for continual growth and forward movement. She had the clarity of purpose and balance in her life. Everything she did was with love. One of the best things Jody left behind for us in her personal and professional life was the example of how important the moments with people we love are. Jody's excitement for adventure and life experiences was shared with the love of the last six years, Mike Amiro. They traveled, hiked, and biked to many places and across continents together. She mentioned many times that Mike was up for anything. Off they would go to do something fun and active, often including her parents, Ron and Janet, Jackie, Michelle, Michael, Crosby, Megan, Caleb, and Christian. These family ties were strong. Mike and Jody shared many of these experiences, as well as their most recent big trip, instigated by Jody, to the big island in Hawaii, 
where Jody, Crosby, Megan, Caleb, brother Mike, boyfriend Mike, and his son Christian explored, laughed, and hung out together. She cherished this time you all had together very much. She had an amazing way of making us all feel special, and she valued the time she spent with you. Jody nailed it in her 46 years. She lived life to the fullest every single day. We will think of her when we see a wild plant blowing in the wind, a rushing river, the sun peeking over the mountains. We'll see her in the faces of Crosby, Megan, and Caleb. We are so very fortunate to have had walked alongside her. Love was a cornerstone of her life. Thank you. Now, I have uh, a few short stories that I've been asked to read. Uh, first of all, uh, concerning Michael. Uh, this first one is by Dave Lockram. Dave says, I was asked by Ron and Janet to put down some words about some of my memories of Mike, but how do you su sum up something as vast as a man's life in a few paragraphs and lines? I can't, but I can share just a few of my memories and impressions of Mike. The first time I met Mike was in junior high when the new kid moved here, Wembley, from Grand Prairie. Let me say I wasn't impressed. He looked like a surfer dude right out of the movies. I thought, what is the deal with this guy? I wondered if he was going to be as strange as he first looked, and he was. But as time went on and we got to know each other better, I found that the similarities between us far outweighed the differences. As we moved into high school in Beaver Lodge, the Wembley kids generally would stick with their own and we started to forge a strong friendship. We had all the normal angst and hijinks that you have in high school, but our friendship didn't really cement itself until we left for the real world. Out of school, we would spend more time, more and more time, excuse me, together. If it wasn't out at the cabin at Wapiti Gardens or a bonfire in Janet's backyard, it was the mountains in Grand Cache or Kakwa or a thousand other places. Sometimes it was with one or both of our girlfriends, sometimes some of our other friends, Farron and Kyle, Cameron, and others, but almost always me and Mike. The moment that locked us together for life was the passing of our friend Cameron at age 21. It hurt us unbelievably, and I think we needed each other to get through it. Some of the stories I am putting down are the ones that represent Mike's character that stand out in my mind. Fearless, once in the mountains near Wapiti Lake, we were crossing a creek and he rode, on, <clears throat> rode in on my old three-wheeler. Well, the water was both deeper and faster than he thought, and away he went. I dropped my bike and went running down the bank to help all the while he was laughing and yelling at the top of his lungs. I swear, for a bit, he had one arm in the air as if he was riding a bull in circles down that creek. Brave. He is the only person that I know that fought a black bear with a rock and won. He has a tremendous sense of humor that was most often expressed by an ear splitting high, <clears throat> excuse me, laugh and a toothy ear to ear grin, usually involving me injured, muddy, wet, 
or in some way flattened on the ground. But he would forgive as well. Once we went hiking on a hiking trip to Jasper with Ron and Janet when we decided to take the raider and go into town to see the lights. As often when with Mike, you drank some beer. That day was no different. On the way back to the campsite, there happened to be a cow elk in the middle of the field. Road, excuse me. Well, after a short discussion, we came up with the thought it would be a great idea if one of us would go pet it. It wasn't. Mike got chased around that raider for about five minutes. And after I locked his door, <laughs> good friend, before he got the idea to roll under it and get away, eventually he gets back in and with that toothy grin says, that was close, huh? Let's go drink some beer. He is close with his family and loved all his sisters to the point that he would take trips with them and schedule holidays to be with them. When we were younger, we went to the Queen Charlotte Islands to hang out with Jackie. It turned out she had arranged a visit to a remote logging camp that was only accessible by boat. Well, we were in our glory getting to run big mountain log trucks, excavators, and boats. Then, once again, the great ideas start flowing. Let's go water skiing. Sure, it's the ocean, but not really. And anyways, we're two tough guys. We swim in the glacier-fed rivers in Alberta. Well, we jumped in, and almost one minute later, two cold little boys from Alberta jumped back out. Much to the laughs of Jackie and her pretty friends, we were trying to impress. That's not to say it was all sunshine and rainbows with Mike. He could be argumentative. He had a bad temper. When unleashed and stubborn, oh my God, could he be stubborn. But even after a big blow, give, and give him a day or two and everything was back to normal. These are all parts of Mike. And all of this is what gave him that special character that is him. As it turned out in life, he never had any kids, but he was okay with that because he loved Jody's as if they were his. First Crosby, then Megan, then finally Caleb. Every time I would see him, I would get the rundown on how each was doing in school or what awards that they had received or how a dance recital had gone. He was so proud of them. A day or two after Caleb was born, I got, excuse me, I got drugged to the Beaver Lodge Hospital to see the new nephew. It was pouring rain and two wet boys stood at the end of the bed until Jody asked Mike if he wanted to hold him. Well, there's that toothy grin again and it stayed on his face for days. Lately, as life gets in the way, we didn't spend as much time together as we once did, but whether it was a day or six months, he would text me, put on some pants, I'm coming over. Then the next text was invariably, do you need beer? Whether it was sitting in my house, watching hockey or a movie, at a campfire, somewhere, we solved all the world's problems, talked about girls, cars, traveling the world, and our relatives. If the world leaders could have eavesdropped, the world would be a better place with all our combined wisdom. This is a very small snapshot of my memories of Mike. As I think back to write this, I realize that I hardly have a memory from about age 17 to about 30 that doesn't, for good or bad, involve Mike somehow. I have thousands of memories of him and the good far outweigh the bad. I find a lot of joy in these memories and can hardly fathom the pain that it brings to me to know that there won't be any more. They say that in life you are lucky to get two or three close friends. I can't give any higher praise to anyone 
than to say he was my friend. Mike was my friend. That's uh, Dave Lockram. The next one is uh, from Magda, Magdi Arki. Is that correct? I'm sorry if I butcher names. I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> okay. I have known Michael since 2002. We have so many unique memories. I would like to mention only a few. At the beginning, his money was very limited, but he was able to buy two tickets to Pavlo, one of his favorite guitar concerts. He even bought an outfit on sale, which was a little hideous, but he wanted to look proper in the concert hall. Only Michael managed to give me toothbrush, toothpaste, and a bunch of roses for my birthday. And the way he presented it gave me such joy and made me laugh. As a matter of fact, Michael found a way to make me laugh when I was sad. Pretending he was Michael Jackson and Billy Idol, dancing in the living room like a maniac. He served craft dinner with candles because for him, the presentation was more important than the food. Michael was the only man on earth to convince me that camping in the pouring rain, top it off with an outhouse, it is the best holiday on the planet. So I made a deal with him. If I try camping with mosquitoes, he must go to Europe with me. Camping turned out great because Michael played his guitar and after a few beers, even Pravarati came out in him. He loved having fun, laughing and keeping the crowd entertained. We went to Europe many times. He loved the old cities, castles, history, food, and of course, the cold, good old beers. He enjoyed cottage living by the river Danube in my hometown of Rakiv. Uh, he was fascinated by the nightlife of Budapest. All those street entertainers playing Hungarian folk music made him buy an old guitar from a gypsy who also taught him a few notes. Even with his limited Hungarian, he managed his way around. One of his favorite shopping places was Wednesdays and Saturdays open market at the river bank. He made deals with the farmers. Only God and Michael knows how he did it. My friends and relatives loved him because he gave so much joy with his happy-go-lucky personality. Michael became best buddies with my cousin Simon after an evening of quality time they spent together in my cousin's wine cellar. <laughs> Don't let your thought patterns go. <laughs> it was entertaining watching, watching them. One spoke Hungarian and Serbian, then the other English and limited Hungarian. My life with Michael was always interesting something out of the ordinary. Our special bond snapped away in a second, but the loving memories will carry on in my heart. That was Magdi. And then the last one I have about Mike is from Kevin Preboshuski. I met Mike in about 1995 when I moved to Edmonton to attend Grant McEwen Community College. We found we had a lot in common and became friends shortly after. He stayed in my house for a few years after university doing his practicum, which helped me afford my newly acquired house mortgage till I got married. We both enjoyed mountain biking. Anything challenging was awesome. Playing music, jamming, and or recording some tracks at my place and just going and hanging out, playing pool, maybe, and having some beers. I will miss the good old days of tearing up the trails on our bikes, as Mike would say, and then doing some recording. One of these days, I will have to look at those tracks, the songs, and finish them with my ideas for percussion and other overdubs, just like we always planned on doing you had a big smile 
and a positive attitude and tried to make the best of things. At 43, you were too young to leave us, but we don't always understand why things happen or what ha plans the Lord has for us. I have many good memories of you, bud, that uh, unfortunately make me sad today. I wish we had time to make more. And that was from Kevin. I have two other people that are a possibility here. I have a Mark Reynolds. Um, is he able to? There you go. This is a short blurb about Mike here. Um, definitely not going to be strong as everybody else here, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Mark Reynolds. Um, one of Mike's really good friends. Mike and I have been really good friends for 11 years now. We met at work. Um, he was a framer. I was a superintendent at a house builder, and we hit it off of friendship right away. Um, Mike and I had a lot of the same interests, to mention a few. Uh, mountain biking, fishing, guitar, and lifted, tr <coughs> sorry, lifted trucks. Um, for those who remember Mike's Little Red Ranger, which he nicknamed Little Evil, yes, it was me that sold him those big tires and convinced him to drop a paycheck to lift that truck. <laughs> all in all, it was a cool truck, but still too small for my friend Big Mike. So along came the Titan. He loved that truck, he wanted to keep that truck, but he always complained that he wanted something smaller and better on fuel. That didn't happen. <laughs> and also there was guitar. Mike was one of the most talented players I know. I always loved our jam sessions together. And what I mean by jam sessions is me playing for a couple minutes and then me spending hours listening and watching Mike play. Mike totally amazed me with his talent. A lot of you, oh man, this sucks. <laughs> a lot of you may not know this, but on August 28, 2010, my wife, Terry Lynn, okay, I can do this. <laughs> we're married. Uh, we're both honored and cherished forever the gift that Mike gave us. Mike composed and played a classical melody throughout our wedding ceremony on his guitar. We have this on video and we are going to cherish this forever. Mike has been a big part of my family. Mike has been a big part of my family since the beginning of our friendship. He truly is my brother from another mother. He is Uncle Mike to my kids. He was so loved and respected by my family. He was there for birthdays for the kids. He brought my wife flowers for our anniversary. Actually, he has bought more, my wife more flowers over the years <laughs> than I have. <laughs> he was the true definition of a great man and best friend. I can ramble on for hours about how how great of a man Mike was but he was but we all know how great he was he was loved by us all we were all very lucky to have Mike in our lives and as much as he will be missed by us all he will remain with us all every day you'll be truly missed by us Mike you were a part of our family and we love you very much give her hell up there buddy save a seat for me till we meet again love you bro Thank you. And the next one is by a Mark Sotart. I 
have to have my, um, my mic prop. It's our, our bike shirt with a guitar that just kind of screamed mic, but I realize now it also says medium. <laughs> Good morning. I am incredibly fortunate that I get to share some stories about Mike today. This bike jersey embodies Mike and I totally. Music and biking. I didn't buy it because of that. It was a clearance item and cheap. That is what Mike really liked about it. Mike and I became really close once we discovered our shared passions. It all started one Christmas when we had the neighborhood over for Christmas carols. Mike, Ron, Janet, and Ron's guitar all showed up at our place. After an hour of carols, Mike and I had had enough and broke into some real music. I think that first song was Brown Eyed Girl, which really isn't that good. But the funny thing is, every time we jammed, Brown Eyed Girl always popped up. I know that it breaks the bro code somewhere to describe anything your buddy does as beautiful. But every time we played, I was mesmerized by Mike's beautiful guitar playing. We shared a love of music for many genres, and he nailed them all. And we also kept in touch regularly while he was back in Edmonton by text. They went like this. This is Mike. KJ talked me into going to this drag, drag queen burlesque show tonight, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm already regretting it, lol. Me, Mike, just don't perform. <laughs> Mike's reply, I'm taking pepper spray. <laughs> me, the next day, did you wake up in drag? Mike's, actually, I lucked out. It was belly dancing with women. We also biked a lot. This past summer, it was three or four nights a week. Or should I say more correctly, we went for a Mike ride. What's the difference? At the end of a ride, if you have something left to give, you haven't coughed up a lung, and you are not bleeding, you simply went for a bike ride. On a Mike ride, you have nothing left. Even minus 15 and a foot of snow didn't stop us. Hand warmers duct taped to our shoes kept the feet warm even though we looked like a couple of idiots rolling past the Starbucks in December. On our second last ride a couple of weeks ago, Mike and I had our best ride ever. We were both in what you can call the Mike zone. It was dark, we couldn't see anything, and we were lost, as usual. On a very steep descent with roots and drops, we were both totally out of control, also as usual, but this time with me in the lead, which was not usual, and Mike following behind me yelling, Mark, I can't stop, don't you dare stop now. When we finally did stop, Mike had that deep belly laugh going, that huge grin. We were like a couple of giddy kids. Coming back from our rides, Mike's laughter always continued as my eight-year-old son, Caleb, <clears throat> was usually waiting for some reason in his underwear. Mike liked that, sort of, yeah. And Caleb loved to talk trucks, give Mike parking tickets, and yet hide some baked home-baked cookies in Mike's truck. Mike laughed a lot at that. He loved the cookies and the fact that Calum knew what a 410 rear end was. Calum really misses Mike. Most rides or jam sessions ended with a hot tub. The Hot Tub Chronicles, we called it. It's here where Mike and I hatched our escapades, shared our problems, tried to figure out life, and had a few beers. Many of those beers I had to open for him due to his guitarist fingernails. I think that also breaks some sort of bro code. Each time, he would always say, I say this every time, but this is awesome. I thought he meant the hot tub being outdoors, but now I know he meant so much more. Mike was in a real good place this summer, content, loving the time in the outdoors, living at the river and being, being near family. Mike helped me so much as I struggled at times. He is the friend it takes a lifetime to find and I will miss him dearly. And yes, Mike, it really was awesome. Amen. Thank you. And now we're going to some stories for uh, Jody. And we're going to start off with Barb Lowe.
Hello everyone. My name is Barb Lowe. In 2005, I had the wonderful privilege of meeting Jody. She was organizing a group of ladies to hike the Skyline Trail in Jasper. I had the good fortune to be invited to join them. I had never hiked before, but during that July weekend, Jody helped me find my passion. Jody's passion seemed to be creating bonds, and she was successful in bringing together a group of strong, talented, creative, and fun-loving women whom she affectionately dubbed my girls. Since then, through the time spent hiking, discussing book club picks, dinner parties, and sipping wine, Jody has taught us much. And this is what we have learned on behalf of Jody's girls. Always say hi, smile, hug, ask how are you, and add chicky, my love, sweetie, whichever is most appropriate. Go outside, hike, look at the wildflowers, see the trees, don't be afraid. Encourage others. Accept their encouragement. Listen. Listen to the wind, the birds, the glaciers, but mostly listen to your kids, your lover, your friends, and your family. Work hard for what you believe in. Help whenever you see the need. Laugh. Laugh loud and long and often and giggle and tell jokes and be polite, be real, read books, share, learn, acknowledge the people you meet, enjoy the quiet, accept a challenge, care deeply. Forgive, love, love who you are, and dance, always dance. Love you, Jody. Now, and now I'll ask uh, Kathleen Turner from the county if she can come up. morning. <clears throat> My name is Kathleen Turner and I'm the Director of Family and Community Support Services with the County of Grand Prairie. I've had the pleasure and honour of working with Jody for the last 15 years. Actually, I've known her longer than that as we first worked together on disaster social services plans when she was with the Red Cross. When an opening came up in our Beaver Lodge office 15 years ago, Jody applied for it and we scooped her up. She was amazing in the small town setting, creating networks and making everyone feel welcome. A few years later, we had a vacancy on our community school liaison team, <clears throat> and Jody was a natural fit for that position. She worked closely with school staff, agencies, and mental health providers to make sure students were connected to the right resources. Her ability to create relationships with students was a great asset. Whether they needed a hug and a supporting shoulder or a gentle boot in the bum, Jody was there for them. She was passionate about many things and advocating for kids was right up there at the top. Many times she went toe to toe with teachers, parents or other agency reps to be the voice of the student. I'd get a call from her saying, I just want you to know what happened today in case you get a call about me. <laughs> but I never did get a call. I think others recognized where she was coming from, and even if they didn't agree with her, they respected her position. Amongst her co-workers, Jody often took the role of the organizer and planner, 
Jodi loved to plan. Boy, did she love to plan. I don't know if anything made her happier than seeing flow charts and flip charts covered with goals and action plans. The walls in her office would have flip chart papers stuck all over them as reminders of what needed to be worked on. It was this, among other things, that made Jodi the obvious choice when we opened up a team lead position that would supervise the school liaison, early childhood, and community programs. I remember when she applied and I called her in for a chat. I said, I'm not going to interview you because I know you're the perfect fit for this job. Being her humble self, she didn't quite believe me, but she did tell me all of the plans that she had already made for it. <laughs> she was going to make the job her own, and she did. Transitioning from a coworker to a supervisor is not easy, and Jody worried about how she would accomplish that without alienating anyone. I think I can safely speak for the staff that she managed that journey very well. Now, Jody loved to meet and talk and create community, and that's exactly what she did with the programs under her guidance. She filled a void and brought the different program areas together to create teams that worked together and supported each other. As if managing those programs and the staff wasn't enough to keep her occupied, Jody was always thinking into the future about how we could do more. What could we do to support the youth out in our rural areas? How could we inform the general population on social issues such as poverty, substance abuse, and mental health, and give support to those who needed it? Early childhood development was a particular passion in educating people on the importance of healthy brain development in children. I think one of my greatest challenges with Jody was reining her in. She wanted to take on everything at once. A few years back, Jody took on the challenge of completing her master's in social work. This is a monumental task at the best of times, but to do it while still working part-time and keeping up with family and community commitments requires dedication and devotion. Jody tackled it like she did hiking a mountain, striding confidently to the top. As I mentioned before, Jody loved to organize and plan, but sometimes even her best efforts didn't work out. Earlier this year, our core staff group did a team building exercise and went to Trapped. If you've ever gone to Trapped, you know that once you're locked in that room, everyone starts looking for clues and they're going in 10 different directions. Everyone's talking and calling out numbers and for the combination logs, it's just chaos. Now, I wasn't in Jody's group, but I'm told that she spent the entire time going from one person to the next asking, what are you working on? What are you doing? And what's your, what's your plan? She even tried to get everybody to stop and come up with a plan. This was definitely outside her comfort zone. They didn't get out in time, but everyone had a great time and lots of laughs. We'll definitely miss that laugh and the million watt smile that went with it. Jody connected with each of us differently and in the way that we needed it. She always had her staff's back and was always there for a catch-up chat or a need, I need to debrief talk. In closing, I just want to say to Jody's kids, Crosby, Megan, and Caleb, your mom was so proud of you. She was your greatest cheerleader and she talked often about your accomplishments. Family was her priority. To Mike, I've heard you say that she brought so much to your life, but please remember, you brought a lot to hers as well. She was incredibly happy, and that happiness radiated out to others. Thank you. Amen. Okay, the next one um, I'm going to read, it's from Mike Amaro. Um, it's her boyfriend, and... I hope I do them right. My Love and Life with Jody Evans, blurbs by Mike Amaro, compiled from Random Thoughts, September 9th, 2016. The first point he brought out was when Jody came with me to visit my family in Nova Scotia for the first time, we went for a hike and my niece Josie was tired and did not want to walk. Jody immediately offered to carry Josie on her back. As she carried Josie, she said, 
I need this for training for my upcoming backpacking hike with my lady friends. Not only did Jody become an instant favorite aunt, but she also displayed her unique mix of kindness and resourcefulness. When Jody met all of my family and close friends at my parents' cottage in Nova Scotia, they could not resist her charm and instantly loved her. I'm pretty sure they liked her more than me. <laughs> she was adventurous. While mountain biking on rough single track trails near Jasper, she witnessed me getting my front tire caught in a branch, flip forward and land on my hands, just giving me enough time to minimize my face to rock on the ground impact, receiving a slight chip to my tooth. You would think that she'd slow down, but not more than half an hour later, she caught herself on another branch, sticking out on a downhill portion of the trail while biking behind me. I first heard her telltale scream, ah! And when I looked behind me, she was airborne. And she miraculously landed on her feet, running. And thankfully, she kept running because her bike was cartwheeling down behind her. But here's the kicker. She was smiling the whole time. No matter what crazy things happened to her, she always seemed to have that wonderful smile on her face. It's another instance where he recalls paintball. In 2012, Jody arranged a paintball birthday party for me with friends and family. At the end of the evening, they ran me through the gauntlet because I'm the birthday boy. Everyone lined up and made me run by them as they pelted me with their left remaining paintballs. They probably had quite a few. Jody was so sweet that she could not shoot me, so she just shot at the ground. Well, at least that's what she told me. <laughs> then they had a trip to Italy. Jody was so appreciative of our trip, Italy trip in 2015 she was beaming with joy every day during the trip and for months after. A simple meal of wine, bread and cheese along a Venice canal was the most romantic thing ever to her. We were lost many times, struggled to get to where we needed to go due to language barriers in the small towns. Had delays on trains and I bumped my head probably 26 times on low-hanging stone archways and windows. We spent one day hiking sketchy trails with steep drop-offs safely, only to return to our room where I bloodied myself, smashing my head into a windowsill. As Jody took care of me, we laughed at how odd it was that I could hurt myself in our safe room after the wild and dangerous hike we did. Jody endured it all with grace with that permanent, wonderful smile on her face, which put me at ease the whole trip and put a permanent smile on my face too. How we broke down barriers. Jody was very reserved around me at first as she tried to figure out how to love me or if she even should love me. Although I can be a very reserved individual myself, I decided it would be best to let go so I could loosen her up. I rigged up one of my childhood G.I. Joe action figures at my entrance on a rope so that it would swing down into her face and attack her when she came in. She said it was hilarious. I went bowling with Jody, Megan, and Caleb shortly after I met the kids. And after getting three strikes in a row, I celebrated by riding a ball ramp like a wild bull. I did it with such gusto, I embarrassed myself a bit. I think the kids might have been a little embarrassed too, but Jody loved it. Afterwards, she talked to me about how she appreciated me letting loose and being comfortable in my own skin around her and the kids. I took a page from the book of Chris and Joanne Chison. 
and started scaring Jody out of her skin whenever we would visit e we visited each other, which tapped the playful nature of our love. This backfired a bit as Jody started trying to scare me too. She was not as proficient as I was, but she did make me hit the roof a few times. It got to the point that we were both scared to enter our own homes. <laughs> My accomplishment came when I hid behind, <clears throat> excuse me, hid in my closet behind my hanger shirts. After Jody checked every corner of my place, she relaxed and headed to the bathroom next to the shirts. I reached out to grab her arm with a roar, and she screamed bloody murder, flapping her arms as if she thought she could fly away. The downfall of this plan was I was stuck in my closet so I received a few well-deserved punches to the chest. Note, Jody was smiling the whole time she punched me. Our love. The love I shared with Jody was natural. We did not need words to express our love. We just knew. We showed our love to each other through our actions. Even during our busiest days, we always made sure to share our love, a lovely embrace hug or snuggle at night or early in the morning. We never argued, we just debated. When we did not agree, and no matter the outcome of the debates, Jody would always hug me afterward. Well, maybe it was to coax me into seeing things her way. Many nights when Jody went to bed early, I would stay up and do my own thing down in the basement. On occasion, she would text me from the bedroom, can you come upstairs and cuddle with me? I obliged every time. This is why I have no regrets about my time with Jody. Every time she asked me for my love or affection, I did not hesitate to give it to her. And that's uh, from Mike. And now I'm going to ask Ginger Gibson if she would come up. Jody and I met when Megan was on board, so 23 years ago. It was a Friday night and I arrived out at her farm. I was going for a simple dinner party at her farm uh, out near Edmonton and I didn't leave again until Monday morning. So <laughs> we got along immediately and uh, we were best friends. She stood up for me at my wedding she saw my babies into this world. We never did anything without her three kids. Our life was entirely centered around Beaver Lodge. And then when my three kids came along, we never did anything without the six of them. They skated in and out of our lives and we skated on the river, the Beaver Lodge River. And it's for this reason that today I'm sharing my memories, but. I'm also sharing so many memories of the kids. It's almost impossible to pick one moment. And talking to Megan yesterday in a wheat field, I realized why it was so impossible. She put it into the right perspective. Yesterday, standing in this beautiful yellow field of wheat, she said to me, there's no way to put the most incredible woman on the planet into words. Megan and I had 23 years of love and laughter with this gal. And there's no moment that stands out, which was what was so confusing for me. Then Megan put it into words. There was a constant stream of adventures, and so it makes it almost impossible to choose one to relay to you. So it's for that reason that I'm sharing what Megan and I came to call last night the little kid memory shards. This is Megan's little kid memory shard. My little kid memories, putting the canoe in the Beaver Lodge River, looking at the sunny trees lining the river, getting stuck, hiding underneath a tree while it was raining with lightning, 
walking up the hill to a house to find help. Jody and I would go on a whim, canoeing on any river. The Beaver Lodge, the Wapiti, the Pipestone, the Athabasca, the Red Willow. It didn't matter if we had two hours or four hours or four days. I remember at times driving like a bat out of hell to get back to the daycare to pick up Caleb, where we'd make it at 4.59. The rivers around here are like the veins of, of Jody. They're the places she raised her babies. She raised them on the rivers, and she raised them around the rivers. Megan, little kid memory shard. Lesser Slave Lake, flipping the kayak around and around, trying to learn how, how to get out from underneath if we lit, flipped in deep water. For her daughter and her sons, there was a fierce, fierce love. My son, Callum, this summer, we went backpacking on the Skyline Trail with the family and friends. And Callum's memory, hiking with her in the mountains on the Skyline Trail, camping, visiting Beaver Lodge, playing by the river. Megan, little kid memory shard, walking to a waterfall during a visit to Caslow. Sunshine showers at the acreage. Yellow sunshine flowers. Last night, we, stood, we ran outside, as we were writing this, we ran outside just after we'd written that part, sunshine showers at the acreage, for a sunshine shower at the acreage. Jody loved to hike Old Fort Point, and she always took a picture every year of the kids always sitting in the chair tree. We also remember Uncle Mike, Megan, little kid memory shard, playing with Uncle Mike at Grandma Janet's and Grandpa Ronnie's. He would spin us around by our feet and tickle us until we got headaches from exhaustion. We would karate fight with him. Even with our three kids on one man, he would still kick our butt. Always with the jokes and always with the guitar on the hand. He was our rock star and we were his biggest fans. Caleb, little kid, memory shard. Driving in the car to the Yukon, reading books, listening to music. These are our, all of our little memory shards. There are thousands of them to bask in. They carried the sunshine with them wherever they went. And as Caleb succinctly said last night, I'll close my, my speech and my words to my beautiful friend, Jody by saying we did a lot. Amen. And now I'm going to uh, ask them to queue up the electronic presentation, and they will be showed on both screens. <laughs> Oh, 
me The radio reminds me of my home far away And driving down the road I get a feeling that I should have been home yesterday Yesterday
asked to uh, share a few words, or told I can, so um, I want to share some words of encouragement. Um, in Philippians 2, 1 through 30, it says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I thought this was appropriate, uh, knowing Jody. I didn't know Michael as well, but I, I believe he had the same kind of personality. The words of encouragement I have are this. Um, I've been around a fair amount of time now. Um, what that means is that I've survived so far, and a lot of people I've known and loved have not. I've lost friends, best friends, acquaintances, co-workers, grandparents, mom, dad, siblings, relatives, teachers, mentors, students, neighbors, and a host of others. I wish I could say you get used to people dying, but I never have. I don't want to. It tears a hole through me whenever somebody I love dies, no matter the circumstances, but I don't want it to not matter. I don't want it to be something that just passes. My scars are a testament to the love and the relationship that I had for that person. And if the scar is deep, so is the love, so be it. Scars are a testament to life. Scars are a testament that you can love deeply and live deeply and be cut or even gouged and that you can feel and you can heal and continue to live and continue to love. And the scar tissue is stronger than the original flesh was. Scars are a testament to life. Scars are only ugly to people who can't see. As for grief, 
you'll find it comes in waves. When the ship is first wrecked, you're drowning with wreckage all around you. Everything floating around you reminds you of the beauty and magnificence of the ship that was and is no more. And all you can do is float. You find some piece of the wreckage and you hang on for a while. Maybe it's something physical. Maybe it's a happy memory or a photograph. Maybe it's a person who is floating also. For a while, all you can do is float. Just stay alive. In the beginning, the waves are a hundred feet tall and crash over you without mercy. They come ten seconds apart and don't even give you time to catch your breath. All you can do is hang on and float. After a while, maybe weeks, maybe months, you'll find the waves are still a hundred feet tall, but they come further apart. When they come, they still crash all over you and wipe you out. But in between, you can breathe. You can function. You never know what's going to trigger the grief. It might be a song, a picture, a street inter intersection, a trail, the smell of a cup of coffee. It can be just about anything. And the waves keep coming and they crash. But in between the waves, there is life. Somewhere down the line, and it's different for everybody, you find that the waves are only 80 feet tall or 50 feet tall. And while they still come, they come further apart. You can see them coming, an anniversary, a birthday, Christmas. You can see it coming for the most part and prepare yourself. And when it washes over you, you know that somehow you will again come out the other side, soaking wet, sputtering, still hanging on to some tiny piece of wreckage, but you will come out. Take it from me. The waves never stop coming, and somehow you don't really want them to, but you learn that you will survive, and other waves will come, and you'll survive them too. And if you're lucky, you'll have lots of scars from lots of loves and lots of shipwrecks. On behalf of Ron, Janet, and the rest of the family, I would like to extend a thank you, a heartfelt thank you for all the support, encouragement, and well wishes that have been extended during this time. They would also like to say a special thank you to those of you that have traveled great distances to give your love, support, and to all of you for coming and sharing of this special time of remembrance and honoring of Jody and Michael's lives. They would like you to please stay and enjoy some food and refreshments immediately following the service. The family will be, get served first. I'll ask to stand and we'll pray and then the family will be escorted out. Let us pray. Blessed be God, the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us all with the gift of this earthly life and has given to our sister and brother Jody and Michael their span of years and gifts of character. God, God our Father, we thank you now for all their life, for every memory of love and joy, for every good deed done by them and every sorrow shared with us. We thank you for their life and for their death we thank you for the rest in Christ they now enjoy. We thank you for giving them to us, and we thank you for the glory we shall share together. And now, Lord, we pray for the Evans family and numerous friends. We pray that you would indeed be their refuge and strength, that you would surround them with your guardian angels, touch them with the wisdom and understanding that only your Holy Spirit can bring. Give them assurance that they will see their loved ones once again. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would remind us, their family and friends, that it doesn't end today. They will need our love, caring, and understanding for a time yet to come. I pray that we would be reminded to pray for them, 
to also put feet to our prayers and reach out, talk to them, spend time with them. Hear our prayers, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll now have the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow as the family exits. Where you fall.